Oh yeah, I'll read the afterward. Times have changed since much of the action described in this book took place. The professional kitchens have become, for the most part, very different environments. At least at the top, <clears throat> at least at the top end. And the, then, then the places described in the text. However, Cillian and knowing the celebrity chef phenomenon might be, it's helped to transform the business. Going out to dinner has become a form of entertainment. Standards and expectations have been raised. Where once chefs and cooks enjoyed little or no prestige, there are now bold-faced names, brands, and personalities. With that glamorization came hope and a sense of pride among cooks and aspiring chefs, and very real possibilities for advancement. That didn't exist in the early 70s when I entered the business. Cooking then was seen as low status, dead-end job for the marginal, marginalized, something you did when you couldn't or wouldn't do anything else. It was very much an... It was very much an us versus them mindset at work behind the swinging doors and cooks often didn't particularly care if they really ate that well or not. They, the customers, were seen as largely uninformed, ignorant, and uncaring or uncaring about what was on their plate anyway. Food still widely regarded as being not particularly important. Attempts to cook attempts to cook better or better attempts to cook better or more authentic or daring food were rarely rewarded. Are frequently punished. All that began to change in the early 80s, culminating with the advent of Food Network and 24-hour food programming, where once well-to-do parents would have been dismayed at the prospect of their child attending culinary school. They began cheerfully ponying up 20000 a year and bragging about it. In real-world terms, what this means is that these days, the people cooking your food in any kind of a decent restaurant are less likely than at any time in history to be spitting in your food or having sex in food preparation areas. They're probably not high on cocaine or heroin or sauteing your fish with one hand while reaching for a tumbler of vodka with the other. That kind of activity is frowned on these days, at least during the service period. There's a unit pride at work in most places that view sloppiness, carelessness, poor food handling, and less than conscientious work habits as letting the side down as potentially foiling the common aspirations of the group. For properly trained and motivated cooks who keep their standards high, there are real possibilities of financial reward, even fame and glory these days. And that's probably a good thing. I sound like Bourdain. He was kind of um, kind of a uh, backpedaling a little bit. I, I don't want to say that Bourdain. I don't want to say that. You know, my vocabulary is not the greatest. That's what we say. People say, "Oh, that's backpedaling." But I don't know. The great three-star kitchens around the world are now staffed largely by the itinerant sons and daughters of the middle class, educated, even privileged, yet working for free. They bounce around the world, working six-month stages, accumulating experience under the masters, and return to their hometown and cities in hope of making it big. People with perfectly good jobs as stockbrokers and attorneys chuck it all to attend culinary school, enamored by the perceived romanticism of a cooking life. Most of this latter group are, of course, soon ground beneath the wheel. It is, at the end of the day, still a very difficult business. Some things never change. Long hours, cramped working conditions, bad ventilation, relentless pressure, volatile personalities, and the endless, often mindless repetition of a thousand small tasks ensure that only the strong, the serious, and those with a sense of humor survive. If this book exposed anything important, is I hope the simple fact that cooking professionally is hard and that the road to any kind of success can be long and a bumpy one. Much of that time spent peeling shallots, dicing carrots, or pulling the leaves off herbs in a hot cellar. The true backbone of the American restaurant industry however, remains largely Latino. As long as American kids are absent from the dishwasher station, there will be Mexicans and Ecuadorians entering the business in great numbers. Soon, and inevitably, to be seen by chefs as a better bet for the prep work than guard manager and then line positions. Unlike their more upwardly mobile peers, they are seen as less likely to move on as being more stable and reliable, thereby promising chefs the kind of stability and continuity we all cherish. The other ones, the incoming white boys look to learn the ropes. And they are the ones who remain behind when the white boys move on to the next thing. Something to keep in mind when you see the almost inevitably white celebrity chef on television or at a public appearance or at an award ceremony is that back at their restaurant, it's often Latino kitchen workers who are making it possible for them to even be there. Though the level of interest in chefs and in cooking has intensified, the focus remains almost exclusively on the chef, a cult of personality propagated and perpetuated by the willing suspension of disbelief by food writers looking for a punchy hook for their articles and by chefs and their publicists. No fools we who are charged with getting more customers to the door to spend money. 
As before, the people actually cooking your food remain invisible, unacknowledged, anonymous, misunderstood. While customers now want to meet the chef who they saw on TV, have him swing by the table for a little FaceTime. Do they really want to meet the kid from Puebla, Mexico, who actually prepared their tuna? Apparently not. While the world of cooking has changed, much remains the same. The basic character of the chef and the cook hasn't wandered too far from the same recognizable personality types found in Orwell. For Lang or B B Melman's sensualists, often socially inept outside the kitchen, frequently dyslexic people with appetites that go beyond food. The kitchen remains a refuge for the fugitive, the obsessed, the border jumper, and the borderline, people who are only truly confident behind a stove or standing at the pass. They still and likely always will share a common ethos and patois. I didn't really know how true this was or how universal until I began to travel. Though I had believed when I wrote this book that I was writing it for a small group of restaurant insiders in the New York Tri-State area. Everywhere I went, whether Melbourne, Portland, Singapore, San Sebastian, I'd hear from cooks a similar refrain, dude, you wrote my life. And believe me, that feels good. I had no idea when I put these words to paper in the early morning hours before going into work that people from as far away as New Zealand would be asking me about this fish on Monday thing or that this thing of ours, the subculture of cooks, was so international. Everywhere I went, I found that uniquely damaged look in the faces of the cooks I met, the expression of a person who has been disappointed many times and expects to be again, but who cannot help but continue to live in hope. It's the look of a talented cook who has cooked too many wild and orders of fish for their customers, though they know full well how they should be serving it. Of people who know that in spite of their best efforts, the restaurant will probably close, the food unappreciated, yet they preserve with the struggle to move things forward slowly, steadily, seducing, even tricking their clientele into wanting the good stuff. There are encouraging signs always, a sudden passion for pork belly, a revival of interest in off a revival of interest in offal, O F F A L, a willingness that didn't exist before to eat oily little fish and stinkier, runnier cheese. And there are also discouraging developments, successful campaigns against the foie gras, more restrictive health and safety requirements which strangle artisanal producers who've been continuing the traditions unmolested for centuries. As for me, for me too, times have changed. I'm writing these words in Bali, Indonesia, having just finished a long swing through Seoul, Jakarta, and the Java interior for my TV show. I'm sitting by the pool at Ritz Carlton waiting on a novelty drink, something in orange with curacao and a lot of rum in it. It will no doubt feature an umbrella. I get paid these days to eat and drink my way around the world, going pretty much wherever I want, and doing, doing pretty much whatever I want, as long as I babble about it to a camera while doing it. My hands of which I was so proud at the end of this book are now as soft as supple, presumably as Rosario Dawson's ass. Last time I cooked regularly was about six months after the book came out. When things got crazy and I found myself gradually transitioning to my new day job, needless to say, the celebrity chef racket has worked out okay for me. Writing and making television, no matter what some whining dipshits may tell you, is easy. Cooking is hard. Any author who grabs about the pressures of celebrity, the difficulty of being on all the time, or the travails of the road, has clearly never worked at busy grill station. I think all my years cooking in hopeless restaurants, even that long period spent chasing dope with cocaine, was good pet was good preparation for a career in the entertainment sector. Anytime I think this is beneath me or this is fucking humiliating, I go in to think of lying to my mom to get a few dollars for crack or selling my books and records on Broadway or working at that horrifying TV-themed restaurant to remember what real humiliation is. It's nice sometimes to know how low you can really go, what kind of bestial behavior you're capable of in times of ex extremis. It takes lunch with some Hollywood fucktard or an interview with an over buttox. Botox news anchor go down a lot easier. It helps also that I benefit greatly from low expectations. Most who meet me for the first time, having read the book, anticipate a savage dog reeking of smoked salmon, drunkenly spewing vitriol. They are surprised, I, I think, that I can actually eat in the upright position and use a fork, that I don't make crude requests for sexual service, service as much, and that their belongings are where they left them when I'm gone. <laughs> There are a few corrections I'd like to make to the text of Kitchen Confidential in the interest of full disclosure and to update those who might be interested. I have, since writing of the book, revisited Provincetown, where my cooking career began. I dropped by Ciro and Sal's restaurant, which I referred to as Mario's in the text, and found to my surprise and delight that Tyrone, actually James Lester, was still there and now an owner. He told me that I was absolutely full of shit when I said that he'd barehanded a hot sizzle platter from under the brother. However vividly I remember that impressive and humiliating display, he assured me that it never happened, that he would never have done anything so stupid, and that it was technically impossible in any case as well. 
Well, I had to remember James as Titan, like he is, in fact, significantly shorter than me. No matter, I would always picture him back then as a giant, towering over me in both size and, um, and, and ability. We discussed the event I described at length and settled on some other macho display of pain endurance, like pressing a finger against a platter or barehanding a stake, something to scare white boy. It did. He did remember, however, that I was so spectacularly inept a loudmouth that he even offered me a job at the fry station. In the ironic developments department, contrary to my assertions that Eric Rippert would never be asking me for many suggestions, or that Andre Solner would never invite me to ski weekends, both events have remarkably occurred. Okay, Mer okay. maybe Eric only showed a glimmer of interest one time when I drunkenly extolled the joys of shellfish cooked with the good greasy red chorizo. Point is, this book got me to a place where I actually hang out with the chefs I admire, something that never would have happened solely on my merits as a cook. That Soltner, long a personal hero, read Kitchen Confidential and enjoyed it, that he found something to like in my account of a relatively undistinguished career is enormously satisfying to me. And I credit another hero of mine, Jacques Pepin, with a lot of what's happened since in the early days when a lot of old school French guys were reacting to what they were hearing about my book, not having read it. It was Pepin who first gave it in and premature of a sort. I was doing a CNN interview and sitting next to me so that he could co comment on my scandalous expose was a great chef himself. It was of course shitting, I was of course shitting bricks. I hadn't really expected the book to sell, so I didn't care so much about that. What scared the hell out of me was that a chef of Pepin's caliber and importance and undisputed authority would do the smart thing and say simply that the book was bullshit, that the old school guys would then wisely close ranks, say pretty much, who was this fucking nobody, Bourdain saying all this shit, it's a big lie. And that would be that, instead responding to the horrified anchor's question, if indeed, as I suggested, untouched bread was commonly recycled in restaurants, but being smiled and said that back when he'd come up, he had his chef discovered him, um, when he'd come up, had his chef discovered him throwing out perfectly good bread, he would have been to death. His confirmation of at least the basic outlines of the use everything dictum fundamental to French cooking was a make or break moment for me. Pepin, Pepin's and later Saltner's words meant a lot. A lot of hotshot chefs went on record as enjoying the book and supporting its reality. And that made a big difference for me. I'm sure they have no idea how much I owe them. With the passage of time and subsequent events, I'd like to add that the Ewok-like Emerald Legace turned out to be not such a bad bastard after all. While my loathing for his show remains undiminished a wiser man would have acknowledged that unlike the far worse talentless non-chef bobblehead dolls who now dominate the food network lineup emerald was actually a real chef once a guy who not unlike me worked his way up the line and who and who uh, okay. a guy who not unlike me worked his way up the line and who unlike me succeeded on his merits as a chef cook and businessman He's been nothing but gracious to me personally in spite of my having made him for a time something of a punchline. I've eaten his food, met his cooks, and have to admire the man for his accomplishments. I hear from mutual friends that he's good in a bar fight, something that only raises him in my estimation. He probably deserves a lot more respect than I gave him here. Stephen, my old sous chef, is happily living and working in an upstate New York community of speculator. At the time of this writing, open his own, uh, at the time of this writing, is about to open his own restaurant. He and his wife are expecting their first child, and I have to say that the prospect of another temple in this world, especially a male one, fills me with terror. <laughs> Adam, real last name, his whereabouts are well unknown. I haven't heard from him in some time. Probably caused a rat bastard owes me money. Beth, the grill bitch, is now my long-suffering personal assistant. Alone among the subjects in this book, she's taking unambiguous pleasure and full advantage of her notoriety. When she travels with me on book tour, she is regularly asked by various hot young sous chefs to demonstrate her famous dry humping spanking technique, something she is usually only too happy to do. I suspect she has one of her victims handcuffed to her radiator right now. I haven't heard from my old mentor partner in crime, Vladimir, a.k.a. Alex Alexej Ketmanov for many years, though his image features prominently and handsomely on most international editions most international editions of Kitchen Confidential. He never surfaced for a comment or a drink. It would have pleased me no end if he at least got and laid off his laid off this book as I did not serve. Um, it would have pleased me no end if he'd at least got and laid off this book as I did, as I did not serve him while as a chef. I recently opened Molly O'Neill's memoir, mostly true and found an account of the author's own experience of the rookie cook at Ciro and Sal's in the years just after I left. Alex and James named and lovingly described in all their 
then debauched glory. Though what do I know about meat, guy? The Irish, not Scottish. Bobby Van was, I'm told, very amused by the story of my interview with him. He remembered me, probably as an idiot. My alma mater, the CIA, is a very different uh, the CIA is a very different institution now than it was when I attended. Much, much better equipped, co-educational, and very much looking to the future. It is no longer the province of Washout, old school Swiss and Austrian hotel and country club guys teaching tired old ocean liner classics and long denigrated buffet scientists. Sciences. They have fully understood and appreciated the transformation of the restaurant business from food service industry to glamour profession and have reacted accordingly. I'm told they even teach media training now. Incredibly, under President Tim Ryan, they have welcomed me back into the fold, even allowing me to deliver the odd commencement address. I have no doubt that the daring Ryan got a hold of flack from the remnants of the old guard for allowing me back on campus to further damage young minds. <laughs> I refer to Ferran Adria via Scott Bryan as the foam dude an act for which I have been suitably punished by Adria himself. While my respect for what Scott does is undiminished, I have come, however reluctantly, to greatly respect what Adria is doing. He's changed the world of cooking with his restaurant, Al Bulli, and with his books. I come to believe him to be the Charlie Parker or Jimi Hendrix of cooking. Just because you like Jimi Hendrix doesn't mean you should try and play like him. Probably because you can't. I think I judge Adria harshly because of the excesses of some of his imitators. Have any eaten, eaten at Al Bulli? Have me sucked the brains out of Pran's heads with Adria have changed my opinion. In fact, I'd like to take this opportunity to apologize to everybody I've fucked over in the years covered by this book. The owner of the rat infested Mexican restaurant where avocado pits and chicken bones would suddenly come falling through the crumbling acoustic ceiling surely do not deserve my thievery, neglect, or my mid-shift crack smoking. Any waiters at Geno's in particular who bore the brunt of my grandma day field mood swings and rage, I'm sorry too. Any waitresses I fucked, either well or not well enough, I'm sorry it didn't work out. Congratulations that it didn't. <laughs> Another correction in the rather pompous last line of about the author graph on the final page. I added that I will live and will always live in New York City. That didn't turn out to be exactly true. I don't really live anywhere anymore. I'm already a man without a country. I'm home maybe four or five nights a month and travel for one reason or another upwards of 10 or 11 months out of the year. So maybe I've already left, though I will always carry New York City around in my heart. I don't know if I can fully relax and enjoy living there full time anymore, having been captivated in strange and wonderful ways by Asia, Southeast Asia in particular. I don't know if I can relax and fully enjoy myself there either, to be perfectly honest. I once felt safe and at home in the kitchen. I knew the rules without I knew the rules. It was a life of absolutes, of certainties. And that comforted me in a way nothing since has, like a lot of chefs. I'm less sure of myself outside the kitchen. It's all my dreams came true. I've had to make adjustments. I have to make them every day. My people skills, beyond telling them what to do or being told what to do and talking shit, weren't the best after my 28 plus years in the life. They still aren't. It says something about me. I think that I am most at ease these days. Am I most relaxed when alone in the smoking room of an airport lounge? Coming from somewhere nice and on my way to another. Muzak playing innocuously in the background. Muzak, M-U-Z-A-K, playing innocuously in the background. A nice orderly itinerary in one hand telling me what to do when to do and where a drink or a cigarette in the other and i'm good i'm free as it were of the complications of normal human entanglements untormented by the beauty complexity and challenge of a big magnificent and often painful world and i'm good i'm free as it were of the complications of normal human entanglements because of money untormented by the beauty complexity a challenge of a big, magnificent, and often painful world. Because he has everything he has now, you know? Human behavior remains a mystery to me. Anthony Mordain, Bali, 2006. So even he's writing this, he's out working, you know? He's not, he, he kind of seems kind of sad at the end, especially since he realized like how he went out, you know? Anyway, I really enjoyed this. Peace, yo.